You are listening to Thrival Nutrition Podcast, episode 63. Welcome to the Thrival Nutrition Podcast with me as your host, Lahana Vigliano. We talk all things holistic living, real food nutrition, fitness, herbs, essential oils, and so much more. I'm here to make your holistic lifestyle simple, easy, and fun for you and your family. I am beyond thrilled that you are here. So let's go over and hop over to today's episode. Happy Tuesday. We have an exciting guest on, Amber Duncan, and she is a certified aromatherapist, and she is going to be talking with us all about like essential oils and pregnancy and labor, and she's also a doula, so that's really awesome. She's just going to give us a couple quick tips on how you can really go into labor um, feeling empowered and you know feeling successful, but also not to stress too hard um, and to worry about so many different things that are that's going through your mind and really focus on bringing a new life into the world. So we're talking all things mommy things, labor, pregnancy, and with that essential oils. Before we get started, I wanted to ask you if you joined the Facebook group yet. Every week I'm going to be bringing this up because I really want you guys in there. I know that we have a lot of listeners and a lot of readers of the blog that need a place to come to and really connect as a community because we all are like-minded. We're, you're obviously listening um, and following Thrival Nutrition. And so we want to bring that to where I'm there and then everyone else there to ask questions and to answer questions, you know, experiences and just get advice. And that is where you're going to find the Facebook group. So I'm so excited about it. Um, we do different themes too. So it's been just a lot of fun. So in the show notes, you can go ahead and click over and check out the group or you can just go to www.facebook.com slash groups slash easy holistic living. <laughs> I know that's pretty long, but um, go check that out. You can just search it in the Facebook app or the Facebook if you're on your computer and um, find us and then just request to join and then I'll accept you. So make sure that you do that. I have been busy trying to pack and make sure that, you know, you guys are still getting new content and new information through the podcast and the blog and stuff because we are only a couple of weeks moving to Texas. If you guys didn't know, if you follow me on Instagram, that's kind of like a main platform that you can really see me face to face Instagram stories. Um, and yeah, so we're moving in a couple of weeks. We're going to Austin and we're super excited about it. So if you're in the Austin area, please reach out to me. I'd love to meet you, especially um, if you're mommy, we can do play dates and stuff. I'm just really excited. We're, I'm based out of Orlando right now and um, I've been in Florida my whole life. So we are really excited to get out there. We visited last year where we went to Paleo FX and we completely fell in love. I really felt home um, when, when we were there and I've never been there before and it just felt right. So we, I don't know, planted a seed and pulled a trigger. And so we're, we leave and we go there. We'll be there in June. So I am so excited. So yes, if you're from Austin and you're listening, I'd love to meet you. I think it's just going to be a fun adventure. And one thing that's really cool is that my parents are taking the kiddos. So the, for the like, first two weeks, um, they live in Alabama, so they're a little bit further away. So they don't really see them that much. But um, the first two weeks, it's just like me and my husband, like adult time, just I don't know, like hanging out and exploring. And I think that is just going to be really fun <laughs> because I I had my son when I was 18. So I don't know. I've always just, you know, came from living with my parents to having a little infant depend on me. So I think it's going to feel really freeing, <laughs> at least for a couple of weeks, of not having to worry about kids and knowing that they're having fun with their grandparents. And I just get to spend some quality time with my hubby. So that's what's going on in my life. Um, today's episode, I'm so excited to be bringing Amber on. I know that essential oils is a topic that can be not confusing, but there's a lot of advice out there, especially in the internet. There's so many things that are like, do this, don't do this. And so hopefully Amber simplifies things for you today and you feel a little bit more confident if you're pregnant or if you're going to go into labor, um, you feel a little bit more educated about this topic than you would, you know, just talking to any random stranger on the street about it. So let's go over and chat with Amber. Hi, Amber. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you doing? I'm outstanding. How are you? I'm doing very good and I'm so excited to have you on. I see that with everyone, but everyone that I have on is like, I'm really excited to have because they bring something to the table that's so important. <laughs> I, and I appreciate that. I'm actually really excited to be here tonight. 
Awesome. Today, so, whenever, any, whenever anybody's listening. <laughs> Tell us, um, our listeners, you know, who you are, what, what you do. All right. Well, I am Amber Duncan, and I am a professionally a clinical aromatherapist. I am also a birth doula, a studying herbalist, um, a Reiki practitioner. Oh, yeah, and I have um, been ordained. Um, but <laughs> I mainly focus on pregnancy and children and safe essential oils use. Awesome. Awesome. And then you're, you're mommy too, right? I mean, add oh, that onto the list. Yeah, I am a mom. <laughs> we'll just pack that one on. I'm a mom of three. Uh, they are ages seven, four, and two. And while, while we're at it, we'll just go ahead and add in the fact that I'm a military spouse. <laughs> I know when people ask me what I do, cause I have two and I'm a wife and I'm like, what don't I do is the question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So um, I am just... CEO, CFO, I am everything. <laughs> I love it. So let's drop, hop into the basics. You know, tell us what are essential oils and ultimately, because we're going to be specifying into pregnancy and labor and things like that, are they safe for pregnancy? Absolutely. Well, essential oils are the chemical components that are left over mainly after a steam distillation. Uh, there are also other ways to get essential oils. There's enfleurage, there's cold pressing, but the main way that most, especially of, you know, your run of the mill essential oils is by steam distillation. And so the, uh, plant product gets heated up with water and then it goes through a condenser and the products left over are a hydrosol, which is a water-based, um, aromatic. And then there's the essential oil and the essential oil is basically a really, really concentrated version of a lot of the stuff that came out of the plant. It's not everything that came out of the plant, which I think is a big misconception because people are like, oh, whatever the herb does, the essential oil will do. And it's like, well, actually there's stuff left over in that plant material or there's stuff that goes in the hydrosol that's actually not in the essential oil, therefore making the essential oil not just like the herb. Mm -hmm. So essential oils are just that. They are very concentrated chemicals uh, from the plant material. Awesome. And... Are, I know this is pretty broad, are they safe for pregnancy? In general, many are, yes. Um, The main recommendation is to wait until at least after the first trimester. Uh, A lot of medical, people with medical background have you wait, recommend that you wait until after about 20 weeks uh, just to make sure that everything with that very beginning uh, hormone shifts and everything that's so important happening in the fetus and with the mom is kind of done. Uh, there's so much going on in pregnancy, especially that first trimester, that it's really best to kind of let it happen mm-hmm. <laughs> and to not really interfere in it, uh, especially not in ways that you know could adversely affect Definitely. the mom or the baby. Definitely. And that, and that even goes for like, not even just essential oils, but herbs in general. I mean, exactly. certain teas and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah, the first trimester is that delicate stage. And I mean... I, I personally, when I was pregnant, I never did. I always try to kind of just stay away the first trimester and stuff. Um, so what are some essential oils that, you know, are safe for pregnancy with some specific ones maybe you love and that you used and how can they be beneficial to a pregnant woman? Absolutely. Uh, there are many great essential oils and, uh, one of the biggest, you know, go-to ones I know that a lot of people love is lavender and lavender, uh, really is recommended probably around after 24 weeks or so, uh, just to, in case there's any hormonal effects from it that you kind of get away from once again, that beginning time when the baby is just coming, you know, and just, you know, learning all those cells are dividing and going all crazy. Mm -hmm. So, but lavender can do a lot of good for relaxation and for, uh, anxiety and must, you know, when you start getting those aches and pains, lavender can do a lot of good. Not everybody loves lavender and I have come to realize and respect the fact that not everybody likes lavender because it's everywhere, everywhere you turn, everything is lavender or rose or some, you know, it's, there's all these standard scents that you see everywhere. Lavender is uh, pretty strong, but mm. because it's such diverse in properties and health benefits, like I've just learned to love it. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few that I've learned to love over time. Uh, and I just, I t- actually took some time. There's so many different types of lavender and so many different varieties that I bought samples of pretty much all of them that I could get my hands on. And that way I could find one that I really loved. So if anybody, you know, doesn't really like lavender, I recommend checking out some of the sampler packs that a lot of uh, the bigger companies 
have an aromatherapy about lavender. And that way you can try all these different ones to find one that really speaks to you, if you will. That's a lot of fun. So another great one is mandarin. And mandarin is kind of one of those underrated, nobody's ever heard of it, (laughs) essential oils. But it has a lot of great effects because it can really help to uplift. So whenever you're, you know, that anxiety starts to set in or that, you know, oh, I'm getting fat starts to set in, you know, (laughs) all those maternal hormonal fun that comes with pregnancy. Mandarin is really great to just be able to breathe in and kind of help calm all of that craziness. Uh, as far as, um, lemon is another really great one. Citruses are amazing, right? Yes. And lemon can help actually a lot with nausea. Uh, A lot of people, you know, try to really avoid, there's a lot of push for people to avoid peppermint, which we can go into why that's not actually necessary. But, um, you know, lemon is actually a really great one for nausea as is ginger. Ginger is excellent for nausea. And you can even use not just the essential oil for that. You can, you know, grate Mm -hmm. yourself some fresh ginger and use it that way. Actually, um, is I know we'll we'll go into peppermint real fast. I know that peppermint mm-hmm. is recommended to be avoided when you're breastfeeding, correct? Because it, it may dry up um, milk. But I would that be the same for pregnancy? Is that different? Uh, so the concern there is that concern, and what we've found in the aromatherapy community that is that it really depends on the woman. And like I, personal anecdote, I tried to use peppermint <laughs> to dry up my supply along with a million other um, old wives' tale happiness, you know, breaking out the (laughs) cabbage and everything else. And I could not, it took me well over a week and a half to get my supply to drop. It just kept on coming. Now, this was also my third child, and I'd already breastfed him for a year. So that might have had some play in it. Um, But what we have found is that peppermint doesn't really risk, especially if you're just inhaling it, a drop in supply. The concern in pregnancy really with it um, is, uh, and France actually has a recommendation that you avoid it from pregnancy all the way up until the child is 33 months old, is because of the potential for spasmodic coughing. And apparently they've seen it where the baby's actually actually having those spasmodic coughs in utero. And so that causes just, you know, some fetal distress and they don't really settle well with it. So that's actually why it's recommended for not overuse in gotcha. pregnancy. Gotcha. You still can use it, especially if you're just using it to get rid of a little headache or a little bit of nausea. It's not one of those ones that you really need to avoid. There are ones that you really need to avoid. Peppermint's not really one of them. You know, okay. as long as you, moderation. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm about to say, I remember I had horrible headaches um, when I was pregnant, like in the beginning, just all those hormones. And I remember people saying peppermint, peppermint. And so I didn't have, I wasn't, into essential oils at the time, so I didn't really know, but I remember just trying to sniff anything peppermint in general. <laughs> it didn't, it didn't yeah. work as well, but <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I know that you know. Um, there's some argument, disagreement. You know uh, that peppermint uh, can actually it can cause your uterus to contract. So I, anytime a woman's having trouble getting pregnant or staying pregnant, I always have her avoid it just in case it's helping to create. Uh, unhappy uterus <laughs> for a baby to implant in. Um, so if anybody's trying to get pregnant and having trouble, I still recommend staying away from peppermint. Once again, that's that whole first trimester. You try to avoid it anyway, kind yeah. of a thing. Yeah. Um, what are some essential oils that are like must have stay away? Like you cannot use it. Oh boy. <laughs> um, there's the quite a few of those, man. Um, I highly recommend people staying away from frankincense unless you really, really need it. Um, Geranium is another big one that you really shouldn't have um, right off the bat. Uh, I have a huge list, and I hate trying to only pull one or two from it. Um, (laughs) Clary sage is huge uh, as far as staying away from it because it can actually, you know, some people use it in that final stage to try and help get contractions going. Um, but it really can send things bad. Uh, and you really don't want to be <laughs> using it first thing off because it's really, really bad for that beginning stages and you don't want to push your body to lose a, a pregnancy. Yeah. So Clary Sage is one of the biggest ones that's in so many blends that you see around. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it's in like all these calming, loving blends and it's like, um, wait, can we 
not use that blend, please. <laughs> I agree. Clearing sage um, isn't it studied to be well with like just PMS, not not being pregnant, but just like it is, yes, feminine absolutely. feminine things, and that's why I love the smell it of is. it. Yes, clary sage, rose, jasmine are amazing for all those womanly issues. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and another big one, some other big ones to avoid, um, wintergreen, which is in a lot of like muscle blends, mm-hmm. uh, is really not safe. And it's really not also not safe for uh, the new baby because it is basically win- uh, liquid aspirin. So it can cause rise syndrome. It can contribute to rise syndrome because that's a aspirin issue with small children. So that's something for people to be aware of just checking their blends. Uh, okay. Anise is another one. Fennel. Um, those are mainly in tummy blends. Yes. So um, once again, checking your blends. And for the most part, you know, you want to, I don't say avoid blends, but you kind of want to avoid blends because you don't always necessarily know 100% what's in them. There have been some problems with some of the bigger companies not putting everything on their label <laughs> that's in their blends. Oh, really? So I, I haven't and, heard that. Oh, yeah. I can I can send you guys some links uh, as far as um, third-party testing pages yeah, that, go, yeah. that actually send out for crowdfunding to um, send off oil samples to be tested. And some of the bigger companies have come back with stuff in their oils that aren't supposed to be in there. But, you gotcha. know. <laughs> I, I love, I'd rather do like, I don't know, single oils. I don't know if that's just me, but I'd rather like make my own blend or just use a single oil versus blends. I don't know. I'm not that big of a fan with like just buying already made blends. I don't know why. I'm just not. <laughs> well, see, there's just something about it, right? Um, <laughs> I love, of course, I'm an aromatherapist, so I love blending. Um, so I don't own, I think I own one blend and it's because it was a friend's and, you know, she, it smelled really good. But then of course it has sandalwood in it. And shortly after that, I sensitized myself to sandalwood, and now I can't even smell it without my throat closing up. So wow! Like, oh, oh my gosh! I can't use that one anymore. So if you want to talk about sensitization reactions, I sandalwood's one of those nasty ones. Um, it has a really low topical dilution maximum, and apparently I went over. I didn't oh. realize I did that, and I'm normally pretty careful. So yeah, oh, <laughs> that's insane. I know I've never I mean I've seen around social media and stuff you know the the horrible stories about people you know using it the wrong way or I know that there was just one on Facebook of someone using I think it was like on guard or something and then they went into like a tanning booth and they had like a burnt it was just the craziest thing I've seen I was like oh my gosh yeah there's different concerns about what oil she was using because she claims to have been using sweet orange for that one um but sweet orange isn't phototoxic so we're uh, the community is trying to figure out what was going on there because it shouldn't have done that. So if gotcha. it was that oil gotcha. or maybe there was something in that oil that wasn't supposed to be, oh, we're still <laughs> waiting on word on that one. Still so, out. Uh, <laughs> the word is still out on that. I'm still watching stuff go by and going, huh, I wonder when we're going to figure that one out. <laughs> um, That's funny. And, yeah, and with fennis and f- fennel and anise, look at that, I just made that a new plant. Um, <laughs> and it's also worth knowing because they are in a lot of tummy blends, and they are really not safe for children um, because they actually can lower your body's ability to stop bleeding. So your small children that are running around bumping, scraping, you know, what have you, you don't want to be applying oils to them that can slow down their ability to stop that bleeding. Um, last thing you want is a kid to bump their head and not be able to stop the bleeding because they also had a tummy ache and you know, you were rubbing a blend on it. Uh, I see that a lot. Um, just, you know, all that it's in those blends and I'm like, wait, we don't want to put that on our babies. Please. No. Yeah. Yep. What are some essential oils that are helpful during labor? So switching from like pregnancy to maybe labor or, or Mm -hmm. how can we, I guess, use them during labor to be helpful? Oh, absolutely. Labor is so much fun. Um, so there are, as far as scientifically proven, uh, tech, we'll put air quotes around that one, um, ones that have actually been studied. There's only about 10 essential oils that have truly been studied for labor. Um, there's obviously other ones that have been used, but it, um, as far as what's actually been studied, there's only about 10. And those include 
your peppermint, um, which is obviously good for your nausea and your headaches, especially, you know, in that as things are changing. Yes. Um, jasmine and rose are excellent. Jasmine's really good for helping with that whole um, expelling the placenta. If it happens to be trying to stick around, um, you can you know use a compress to help with that. Rose is excellent for the anxiety and just the hormonal shift that's happening in labor. And then you have geranium, which is better for postpartum, not so much for in labor. Uh, once again, because it's not good so much for the baby, um, but it's really good for lifting mom's spirits afterwards. Uh, Roman chamomile is an excellent antispasmodic. So if things are just getting, you know, the legs are getting tense, the arms are getting tense. You can use that for a massage because it's a really great oil to help. So um, lavender, of course, mandarin, like I was suggesting earlier, lemon again. Uh, frankincense is another really good one just for calming and kind of reminding mom to center and ground, especially if she's going for an all natural labor, you know, you kind of get all that pain <laughs> sneaks up on you and you know, you're just like, ah, what do I do? And so that, that the frankincense can be there to really help ground and remind mom, okay, this is why I'm here. What am I doing again? Okay. I'm giving birth. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, and then of course there is of course clary sage. So I, from a professional standpoint, I recommend that if you're going to use clary sage, you only do it if your doctor or your midwife knows what they're doing uh, because there's things you need to watch for um, as far as fetal distress with clary sage that, you know, not your average neighbor or Joe Schmo will know what to watch for. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. And what's the best way to use them in labor? Is it like diffusing or is it massaging into the skin? For a lot of it, it's going to be just um, inhaling them. And I don't recommend using a diffuser because if you get sick of the smell or it suddenly is giving you a headache and we all know with labor, like suddenly shifts will happen with the hormones. <laughs> so, um, True. using, uh, the aroma sticks or the aroma inhalers, or even just putting a drop on a cotton ball into a baggie and putting that in your birth bag is honestly the best way to go. That way you can seal it, put it away and you don't have to smell it again <laughs> in the event that you don't like that smell anymore, which that's, has happened before. So especially true. Especially if transition happens. So, that is um, so true. I didn't even think about that because <laughs> I remember when transition was like the last stage of like before birth. And I remember I just got so nauseous real quick at the <laughs> drop of a hat. And oh my gosh, it was terrible. And you're ready to stop dealing with everybody. <laughs> yeah. like, and I'm done with all of you people. Um, so yeah. yeah, I don't recommend diffusers. I know that there's a big push, you know, uh, from the people who don't necessarily know what they're doing uh, to have all these diffusers and now hospitals are getting on the bandwagon because so-and-so, you know, recommended it. And it's like, wait, no, we don't need diffusers in the room. Not only can then they get, you know, splattered with something and then you have to clean them and, you know, who knows if we're cleaning them good enough. Um, but, you know, you just don't want to not be able to change that smell. And then, of course, you don't want the newborn coming into a room saturated in essential oils. Because we're seeing a rise, this r weird rise in children being sent to the NICU for no apparent reason. And so I'm watch I'm sitting back and watching and waiting for people to be like, oh, wait, we had diffusers running. And then, you know, kids are having breathing problems and not, you know, coming to as quickly as they want them to. And so I'm waiting to see if there's a link there um, because I wouldn't be surprised if there was. Yeah. So I, I mean, I know that people are like, yeah, kind of diffuser friend, like, they're, they just love them but I've uh -huh. always wondered on like certain essential oils what if people are sensitive to it like that or maybe right. just walking by and that could be anything from like hospitals or even like you know I know teachers that have them but what if some kids are like sensitive to a certain uh, oil you know oh my word yes um <laughs> I you know this I think schools need to take a step back with because there are teachers that are using them and I found out actually recently that my son's preschool not his teacher but another teacher was using a diffuser and I'm going, what if a kid has an asthma attack or yeah. what if the kid is, you know, has an epileptic seizure because you know, that scent sent them off. You're opening up, not a, you're opening up the school and the city to a huge lawsuit by having that in there without telling the parents, without asking the parents. You know, and even if you ask the parents don't necessarily aren't going to know if one day this is going to set their kid off, you know, um, Lavender yeah. can interfere with people with hay fever and things like that or with asthma. You know, Roman chamomile can do the same thing. So it's like you can't just be putting stuff out there because it's like medicating a child. And you can't medicate a child without the parent's permission and without their doctor's okay. 
So why is it okay to put a diffuser in there? Yeah, I've, I've always thought that when I, because I remember when, when I first got into essential oils, it was kind of, it was introduced by certain companies and mm-hmm. um, certain people in companies. And looking back and hearing the advice that I got, I was just like, what? <laughs> it's crazy that there's advice like that going around. Um, it's everywhere. It is. It's not even that it's going around. It's, you know, it's what everybody's inundated with. You know, you hop on Pinterest, you know, look up essential oil recipes. What's the first thing you're going to see? You're going to see all these crazy recipes for putting like 50 drops inside of a 10 milliliter roller ball. Well, a safe dose for a child is max of two drops <laughs> in a 10 milliliter roller ball. For adults, yeah. four. Yeah. Um, what ch- who needs 50 drops? And it's like, top it off with carrier. And I'm like, no, can we, oh, can we not? Like, <laughs> you can't see my face, but it's just, you know, one of those like sad, <laughs> can we not do that? Poor kids. And I mean, I'm seeing I don't know. myself I, personally. I, I thought that you could put quiet. neat on everything. Like, I thought you could just put it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> but unfortunately, not everybody knows. And they just, you know, somebody tells them that it's okay. And they take it at their word because they think that if you're telling me this, then you've at least studied, you at least know what you're talking about. And a lot of the people that are giving out this quote unquote advice are people that have no, you know, background in education in the field. And I mean, that's honestly what's leading us to all these FDA, you know, situation that we're having and what will probably end up leading to us losing essential oils on a whole is because of all of this unsafe advice and people who don't know what they're talking about, just telling everybody to do stuff. And it's a game of telephone. (laughs) Oh, oh, definitely. The station is made and then all of a sudden it blows up into something that it never was supposed to be. Definitely. So um, outside of essential oils, give us some, because I know that you're a doula too. So give us some other things that we could do beforehand and that's even including like some must-haves in the labor hospital bag to help prep for just a healthy and empowering labor. Uh, one, the biggest thing you can have with you and you can't even pack it in your bag is your mindset. Heading into labor, you know, truly mindset is everything. Um, remembering that even if you have the best birth plan and the best docs and, uh, or midwives or whomever on your birth team, at the end of the day, some sometimes stuff goes sideways, and thankfully we are, you know, in a day and age where if it does go sideways, we're able to still help. And I think people get wrapped up in, well, it wasn't my perfect birth. Well, I love, you know, I'm glad. Get down, cat. Sorry, she's trying to turn off our call. <laughs> um, I love that we are in a day and age where we're able to be like, I want this perfect birth, but you know, sometimes we have to do what's best to save your life or the life of your child. And so mindset is everything. While you can have a great birth plan, knowing that if it does go sideways, you want to do everything you can to remain calm and take care of, you know, yourself and your baby. That's very, very important. And, you know, taking time in advance to make sure you do have a birth team that you like. Um, I had to fire the first midwife that was in, that was in my first delivery. Um, she was just not the right fit for me, especially not to be delivering after 46 hours of induction. Um, you know, and sometimes you just got to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, having a lot of times, you know, the hospitals have a lot of stuff there. So you don't have to pack a ton of stuff in your bag, which is why, I, you know, for the aromatherapy, I'm like, oh, just put a couple of drops on a cotton ball and throw it in your bag. You have it with you, but it's not taking up a ton of space. You know, because you don't want to be taking up a ton yeah. of space. Hospital rooms get really tiny really fast. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, um, having the things with you that mean a lot, you know, and sometimes that's just your significant other. Sometimes that's, you know, a picture of somebody really important to you. You know, really take time and look inside yourself. There's a nice quote for you. Um, to see, you know, what is really important to you to have with you. You know, having baby's first outfit, of course, is important. Having comfy clothes, if you're going to be nursing, obviously a nursing row. Yes, Um, oh my gosh. Those things are important, but at the end of the day, you know, as long as you're comfy, your significant other or somebody can always go grab you something. So, 
I, I tend not, I've had three kids <laughs> I'm at the point where I'm like, eh, you'll be all right. It'll be fine. It's, um, it's so funny yeah. because I've had two. And so my first one, I was like, everything by the book. I have to pack the <laughs> perfect bag. And then uh-huh. I swore after you just have the first one, the second, the third, the fourth, you're just like, eh, I'll survive. Just bring me diapers <laughs> and a, the baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. My first one, I think I had three bags with me. <laughs> and man, that room got small. You know, I had the camera and the camcorder and I had, you know, several outfits for me, several outfits for her, you know, tons of diapers. And I'm like, you know, second and third one come around. And you're like, why did I pack all that stuff? What a waste of everybody's energy. It's not even just the bag, though. It's just a room in general, like the nursery. My son, you know, had everything ready. And then my, you know, he ended up co-sleeping with us for four years. And then when my daughter came, we didn't get a crib. We knew she was going to co-sleep. Like, she didn't get a, like, I don't know. We just totally, literally didn't even make her room because we knew she was going to live with us. She had a little pack and play next door bed that she didn't even sleep in. But Priya was like, diapers and clothes, you're good. Yeah, that's what we did with our second. It was a pack and play in our bedroom and a little dresser for his clothes and that was it for his prep work yeah and then the third one was another boy so he really didn't have like it was like oh look the pack and plays back out and we're throwing all the baby clothes back in the drawer <laughs> <laughs> you know um yeah and I think that it's really it is hard to understand though as a first-time mom I know and you know and looking back yeah. I'm like I wouldn't have listened to somebody like me going oh you'll be fine when I was I'm like no it has to be perfect yeah. So, you know, it is one of those things that you just learn by experience and that you kind of don't listen to everybody beforehand. You're like, no, I know how it has to be done. And then you're yeah. like, oh, this is what they were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and getting like every baby toy crawler walker thing possible. And it's so funny. Yeah. After your first one, you just realize what you like. Most of the stuff is really not necessary. A car seat, a diaper, like it's not, it doesn't need to get so fancy and crazy in the labor room after. I mean, whatever it is, like don't, definitely don't stress about it. Exactly. Yeah. And I, that's the biggest thing that I try to stress to any of my clients is just, you know, this is such an huge occasion the you know the birth of your child whether it be your first your fifth your tenth you know um that still is just it's huge to bring a new life into the world and remembering to not worry about those little tiny those tiny things of you know is everything perfect um and just being there in the moment yeah and you know being there with your new baby and enjoying labor as best you can (laughs) is that you know that transition and it's a huge um, if you think about it from you know a psych perspective, um, that's a huge change. You're going from this thing being inside of you that you've been growing, and now it's outside of you, and you don't you can't take it with you everywhere like you used to, and you have to you yeah. know now account for it. <laughs> and like there's all this stuff that goes with it, and so like I don't think we give here in the U.S. I don't think we give moms enough you know time to really deal with that and the huge change that it is. Yeah, um, not only you know physically with all the hormones changing and her body completely going, you know, sideways, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, just the mental component of she needs time to get things back together uh, because it is a huge, huge moment and it's a big change. Yes, so definitely. Mindset is everything. <laughs> That's awesome. Did you have any other, before we um, share where our listeners can find you, do you have any other essential oil tips for us? Um, for our pregnancy and uh, moms, I definitely recommend looking into hydrosols okay. uh, because hydrosols are that water left over after steam distillation. And they are absolutely amazing because they're really, really gentle. So they're a lot better for women who are pregnant, uh, elderly, small children, anybody with a compromised immune system. They are so much more gentle and can still do a world of therapeutic good that uh, people haven't really looked at them uh, so much. They're like, oh, what's a hydrosol? And so I really recommend everybody take a minute, go look them up. <laughs> you know, if you can, get a few. Uh, Roman chamomile hydrosol is excellent for teething. Um, you can apply it to the jawline, outs- you know, the outside jawline, and it really helps with that pain associated. So I highly, highly, highly recommend hydrosols for anybody that uh, is looking into aromatherapy because it still falls within that purview. So It's a lot of fun to look at all the other things you can kind of do and definitely look at aromatherapy inhalers because those are definitely a go-to. Aromatherapy is best inhaled. Um, When you think aromatherapy, it is about the aroma and um, you do a lot of good by inhaling scents. 
Um, and you don't necessarily have to have that diffuser because diffusers, you know, aren't really good around kids. They're not good around small animals, cats, gerbils, you know, that, that kind of thing. So having aroma inhalers are an excellent substitute. Plus, you can put them in your pocket and take them anywhere you go. Awesome. So, awesome. So where can our listeners find you? Oh, wow. Everywhere. Uh, <laughs> try right. to be a little bit everywhere. Uh, I am on Facebook as Holistic Health Helper LLC. Um and then I am on Instagram as the same. I'm also as um, the Essential Oils Goddess. That is my uh, Instagram for my Etsy shop, which just opened last week. Um, mm. Yay. <laughs> and I, my website is theapothecaryinstitute.com because I am working on creating a full school of educational material. Awesome. That sounds awesome. So um, what's in your Etsy shop? right now, not a lot. <laughs> um, I'm working, trying to add something new every day because I've got a huge backlog of things that I want to add, um, products that I've obviously created and have worked well with other clients. Um, so right now there is a pregnancy um, set on there. There is a set for chakras. Um, there is a balm that is actually amazing for skin healing. It has no essential oils in it. It is all carrier oils and it does some really great things with psoriasis, eczema, um, like the yeasty kind of rashes, diaper rash. I've seen it heal up a ton of stuff though. Of course it does not prevent cure, treat or diagnose anything. Um, yes. there's my FDA little <laughs> tidbit, um, but I, it has helped very many people lots of people um, do a lot of things. And I have pictures up there of some of the um, rashes that we've seen heal up with that balm. So it's really cool to watch. So, and then awesome. this week is actually going up a Mother's Day set. Ooh, so. that sounds good. I will definitely make sure all these are linked in the show notes so people can go and check them out. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Thank and then you. people can always shoot me questions anytime. I love answering questions. Do awesome. it all day, every day if I can. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye bye, everybody in the podcast. The contents of this podcast are for educational purposes only. This information is not intended to replace a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a qualified healthcare professional, and it is not intended for medical advice. This is the sharing of knowledge and information from education, research, and experience. I am not a registered dietitian or physician. I encourage you to make your own healthcare decisions based on your research and partnership with a healthcare professional. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next week.